So more or less, this is just an overview of chapter five of the book Handbook of Missing Data, on which Dr. Seattis here is a editor, and it's written by Michael J. Daniels and Joseph Hogan. Also, I used uh, Dr. Davidian's notes from 790, which all of you should probably go download after this lecture. So a quick overview of Bayesian inference, and since everyone here is a PhD student, this will be very brief. So uh, the parameter theta is considered random in the Bayesian paradigm. So this means that it can be described via distribution. And what we want to get at is the posterior distribution of theta so that we can plot it, figure out quantiles, and stuff like that. So in uh, oh. no worries. Oh, okay. So, P of theta is in uh, the notation of this presentation is going to be the posterior, the prior distribution of a parameter, and it represents the information that we bring in to the problem. And the full posterior distribution using Bayes' rule is this right here, and I'm going to use Z instead of Y for to signal to signify the data that's observed. So, just to clear up notation for what I'm going to use. Uh, let z sub i be a univariate response variable. Um, have it go from 1 through n. And since we're going to talk about missing data, let's suppose that only a subset of those observations are going to be observed. So <clears throat> because we only observe a subset, we're going to have another variable called r sub i, which is an indicator variable which denotes whether or not the ith response is observed. So if r sub i is 1, then z sub i is observed. And if it's 0, then it's not. So the full data in uh, all problems is all of the z, whether it's missing or not, and then the vector of r's that we have. And uh, for the sake of notation, denote the part of the data that's observed as like z sub r without a bar, and that's what's not observed is z sub r with a bar on top of it. So this example will s illustrate the importance of I suppose this talk and the prior information that you bring in into a missing data problem. So if we let z sub i given r, ri equals r, be distributed as a normal variable with mean mu sub r. So here the mean is different for when ri equals 1 or when, when ri equals 0. So you can write the expected value of z, which would be mu, as a weighted average of the part of the data or the mean that's not observed and your the mean that is. So theta here is the probability that uh, the z is not observed, and mu1 is the expected value of z given it is, and mu0 is the expected value of z that, given that it's not observed. So if we set two priors uh, for mu sub 0 and mu sub 1, because there are two different parameters in this, uh, and have mu0 be normally distributed with mean a sub 0 and variance tau sub 0, and then mu 1 be normally distributed with or mean a sub 1 and variance tau sub 1, you can write the posterior of mu as this fun statement here. So theta, which is the probability that the data is missing, is multiplied by the prior that you have. There is absolutely no information about whether or not that prior is correct in the data because you don't observe that data. And 1 minus theta is the probability that the data is, so theta is the probability that it's not observed. And 1 minus theta is the probability that it is. And b, z bar, and 1 minus b, a minus 1 is just the normal distribution and how it weights the prior and what you observe. So the z sub 1 bar is calculated as the average of the complete cases. And b is this expression right here, and n sub 1 is the number of observations you actually observed. So this is sort of, this is really important because this shows that, or the next slide will make this point. So the top line right there is a reprint of the previous equation. So this shows that as your data size increases, as, as, as n approaches infinity, the impact of the prior on mu1 goes to zero because we are getting information from the data about it. But 
the prior on mu0 <coughs> will always have a non-zero weight because there is no information in the data about what uh, about the mean for that part of the data that's missing. So the priors you specify are really important because they're going to directly impact your estimate from you. Whereas, say, if we just observe all the data in the Bayesian framework, at, at some point the prior would get uh, dominated from the data that you observe. So also, uh, this is, I guess, will ap appeal to the notion of consistency here. Uh, the variance is given by this expression where tau zero was the variance of the part of data, the part of the data which, or the prior on mu sub zero. So the variance is, the first part of the variance is theta squared tau sub zero, and the second part takes into account the data that you observe. This part goes to zero as n approaches infinity because that top n sub one is going to be dividing one minus theta squared. So that's going to go to zero, but theta squared tau zero is never going to go to zero. So in the context of missing data, this, this means that there's a lower bound of the variance, unless you make strong assumptions about the prior or, or what the mean of the unobserved data is relative to the observed data. So this, um, there's a lower bound on the standard deviation. And one of the assumptions that you can make um, to make this a consistent estimator is have the, the prior on mu sub zero be equal to mu one. So there's a point mass where mu sub zero equals mu one. So there's no variance. So the second term is al also goes to zero, or the first part goes to zero and the second part goes to zero as you observe more data. So <clears throat> it can lead to consistent estimators. So th therefore, I mean, strong prior information is required uh, for missing data. And it, in almost all situations, you cannot really verify whether your prior is right because your prior is based on or is about data that's not observed. So there are three types of uh, missingness patterns in the literature that you'll probably be exposed to. The first type is called missing completely at random. And <clears throat> that's where the missingness pattern is completely independent from the data that you uh, are interested in. So the probability that uh, for, for a particular missing this pattern is a constant. It's not dependent at all on the data. So if you think there's a 50% chance of this, like whatever variable of interest being missing, like that's constant. That's not dependent on whether or not your variable of interest is high or low. And in that case, you can just do a complete case analysis because it's, it's constant and you would assume that out of if you were intended to collect 100 and you only collected 50, you could still do just an analysis of 50. The clip fell off. All right, I'll just hold it. <clears throat> so the missing at random assumption, which I talked about in the, on the previous slide, is that the probability, or the missing the missingness patterns only depend on the observed data. So instead of it being a constant, you can sort of get at where you can just do complete cases. In this case, you really can't. But you can, since the, uh, the probability of missing this only depends on the data you observe, you still have information that you can then leverage to conduct a, a complete analysis. And the last one, which is called missing not at random, which means the probability of missing this depends on data that you don't observe. And you can't really do much in those situations uh, without really strong prior information, which again is not going to be verified from the data. So uh, the, I guess the, the biostatistics uh, recommendation is that whenever you do a study, you assume that data is missing at random and you do a sensitivity analysis to it. Um, all of these assumptions are not really verifiable from the data at all because if you assume missing at random, the only way you would disprove it is to show that the data is, or the missingness patterns are dependent on data that's not observed. But then you can't prove that because you don't observe the data. Whereas you can do a comparison between MCAR and M missing at random, but that requires that you assume missing at random in the first place. So you, your assumption of missing at random is not verifiable, but if you assume it, then you can compare whether it's MCAR or MAR. So all of this, all of these assumptions, you can never really verify. 
So that's why it's really important to really understand the context and then bring that into a problem with prior information. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, naive methods that, ha that are usually done. One of them is just complete cases. So you, you would drop all of the variables that have not been observed. Um, this is okay if it's you're doing missing, if you assume missing completely at random. It's probably okay if only like 1% of your data is missing. Uh, but again, you probably want to spend a lot of time trying to understand why something is missing before you do this. In longitudinal studies, say if an observation or if a, did you have a question or just, uh, so if like a subject is, uh, comes back and gets measured over time, sometimes they drop out or they're intermittent missingness. So you can do an available case analysis, which just ignores the missing data. And uh, I think like SAS and R will automatically do that if you do like prop mix or something. So last observation carry forward um, is where you just observe that the last observed point, or assume that the last observed point is the next observed data point. So I'm, it's unfortunate Cole wasn't here because I was going to make a joke about the Cubs. <laughs> like, because <laughs> imagine like if you were trying to do an analysis on World Series winners and you ended at 1908, and that was all the data you had, then you would just impute the fact that the Cubs won the World Series every year from 1908 <laughs> to 2015, and it just hasn't happened yet. So that's last observation carry forward, and I mean, you, I guess a, a lot of people use it in supposedly clinical trials. I think it's a bad idea, and if you do a simulation study, you'll, uh, you can, you'll be able to see it. <laughs> So, and single imputation is where you just plug in the missing values one time using a regression, or you can use the mean of all the variables you observed. Just an ad hoc way. You just want to plug it in, and you just do it one time. <clears throat> so the full data are R and Z, and the Z can be subsetted into the observed part of Z and the not observed part. So there are three or the first two here, so the selection model and the pattern mixture factorization are the one that are more, that were more focused on the frequentist framework, but the extrapolation factorization also comes in when we talk about Bayesian stuff. So all of these just use basic probability theory from like 521 and how to factorize these densities. So the selection model is that the probability of R and Z is R given Z and the probability of Z. So that's really important because there's gonna be something called ignorability that I'll talk about, where if you d use the selection model factorization and some assumptions are met, then you can just do an available case likelihood analysis, which, again, all of the assumptions are, cannot be verified, but if you just want to make them and do that, then you can. And then pattern mixture is uh, Z given R and then probability of R. So it's called a mixture because the probability of R uh, is used at, and you can like sum over it to find the marginal densities. And the extrapolation factorization, which was something new that I saw in this paper, is where you um, find the joint density of these two, the, the observed data and the missingness patterns, and then, like this is called the extrapolation distribution, where you can predict the missing values from what you've observed and the missingness patterns. So I'm gonna in index or uh, also condition the density of R and Z on a set of covariates X and a parameter theta, which, and then so what we can do is go back to the selection model factorization and just use that, but C, C of theta and gamma of theta are functions of the parameters, so it can just subset the parameters, like if there are 10 parameters in theta, it can choose five of them for, from C or in five, the other five in gamma. So it's just it's a notational stuff. So some, this uh, thing called ignorability, which will allow you to do just a likelihood analysis, or uh, in this case, just find the posterior distribution, is, is met when the data are MAR. And, so, and assuming that the parameters in C sub theta and gamma sub theta are distinct. So you can separate that, that whole vector of theta. And then, so the first two are hold for the frequentist framework, that's really all you need. There's also s maybe a separability condition that, that you also need, which means that there's no information in gamma about C, but in the Bayesian paradigm, you have to have a priori independence between the two parts of theta, where, which means that the prior distribution just factors into two distinct elements. So if ignorability holds, um, 
which means these three assumptions hold. Then the posterior distribution of theta just factorizes into a part which is observed on, or which, which is a part which is dependent on the observed data, or, or both of them are, but this doesn't include the missingness pattern. So if we assume that, let's go back to, no, we can just go there. So P, Z, given X, and gamma of theta. And if we assume that, and that's the data for the, uh, the distribution for the full model, right? Because Z is all the data that we observe. So if we can separate C and gamma and get to this factorization, and the primary parameter of interest is going to be gamma because that indexes the full, full data. And we don't really, we wouldn't really care about the missing this pattern if we can just get at the parameters for the full data. So now if we can factorize it this way, we can just ignore the, this part of the factorization and just focus on this. And this is something which you can just, I mean the posterior density of gamma then just factorizes into uh, Z of sub, the observed part given gamma and X and the prior for gamma. So here you can just do, you can just, I guess uh, in Neil's words, turn the Bayesian crank and uh, get estimates for gamma that, that you want. And in the frequentist framework, instead of obviously having a prior, informa prior information, you would just do a likelihood analysis on the available cases. Because these sub R here is, are the available cases, the, they're the observed data. And I mean, you can, I think in the context of missing data, especially prior information is probably really important. You want to completely understand what's going on in a problem and bring that into the problem. And here you're given that additional level of flexibility or information, which you won't be in the frequentist paradigm. Any questions so far? No? So uh, ignorability, that's, that's only for the first type, the selection model? Yes. Yeah. Or okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, I mean, if, well, all of these, all of the right sides, I mean, are this, the joint densities, they're yeah, equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, fact, if you can factorize it this way, then yes. Like, because now you can just, like, of interest in an analysis is not going to be the missingness pattern. Or, I mean, it could be, but in most situations, people will want to focus on what is the distribution of the observed, yeah, 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 yep.